And we both decided right away that by far the most interesting way of approaching that concept was subjectively, to tell the story in the first person. And also, they both alternate between the objective and the subjective. So in the screenplay, what I did is I said, I need a way of breaking up the flashbacks so that we uh, separate the scenes in our mind. So what I did is I alternated between these color sequences that are intensely subjective. We're always in his head. We alternate with these black and white sequences that, at least to begin with, are objective. They're presented a little bit, a little bit more in a filmy way. It's black and white. It's grainy. Um, the shots are sometimes overhead, a little bit more distance. It's a more objective view. That was the voice of Christopher Nolan, but he wasn't talking about Oppenheimer. No, he was speaking over 20 years before he made that about his film Memento. Memento is famous because it is told in reverse. Not like Tenet where time literally goes backwards, but rather the scenes are in reverse order so that the viewers understand the short term memory loss of the protagonist. The reverse scenes are intercut with a black and white set of scenes that are told in chronological order, and at the end of the film the two timelines meet. Sounds familiar, right? Memento was a film that cried out to be re-edited into chronological order to see if the story still worked when told sequentially. There are some fan edits out there that kind of do this, but an official version was released in 2002 as an easter egg in a limited edition DVD. Well, 20 odd years later, I am following in that grand tradition. Allow me to present... That's right, I have re-edited Oppenheimer into chronological order and if you want to, you can watch it. But if you, like me, love this movie, then your reaction to this is probably... What are you doing? I will be the first to agree that this edit is pretty close to sacrilege. Oppenheimer is a masterpiece of a film and is one of the best screenplays in modern cinema. A huge amount of why this movie is so extraordinary comes from its non-linear structure. I am not for one second saying that the film is better in chronological order. I hope I didn't lead anyone to believe otherwise for an instant. No, it is objectively worse in just about every way and you really, really do not want to watch it like this. But despite my love for this movie and for Nolan's style of non-linear storytelling in general, I wanted to make this edit as a kind of academic filmmaking and storytelling exercise. I wanted to unpack why Nolan chose to structure Oppenheimer in the way that he did, and to better understand how he was able to use non-linear storytelling so effectively. So I re-edited the entire film into a perfectly linear story, starting from Oppenheimer's days at Cambridge and running through the events in the order they actually happened, concluding with his medal from Lyndon Johnson. And already you can see the problem because that devastating, instantly iconic ending now comes about two thirds of the way through the movie. I told you. Chronal Oppenheimer is terrible and you shouldn't watch it. So instead you can just watch this video where I will explain both the editing process I went through to make it, but more importantly I will analyse why this story is so much more powerful when told in a non-linear fashion. And if after all of that you still think you want to watch this movie and if you own a legal copy of Oppenheimer then I'll tell you how you can do that. But trust me, you don't want to and here's why. Oppenheimer, like Memento, is a story told in two parts, fission and fusion. Fission is told from Oppenheimer's perspective, often literally, as he recounts his experience on the Manhattan Project to a panel in charge of renewing his security clearance. The interrogation functions as a framing device for the majority of the story, which are flashbacks to Oppenheimer's life. The second story, Fusion, is told from the perspective of Louis Strauss. It's pronounced Strauss. Sorry, Louis Strauss, as he faces a Senate confirmation hearing. This hearing also functions as a framing device, and flashes back to Strauss's various encounters with Oppenheimer over the years, culminating with the revelation that he was the one who orchestrated the security hearing in order to destroy Oppenheimer's reputation. So here we have our first challenge with putting the story in chronological order, because it's not two stories, it's four stories. In chronological order you have the Manhattan Project, then you have Strauss's past encounters with Oppenheimer, then you have Oppenheimer facing his interrogation, and finally Strauss's Senate hearing. Now it's fairly straightforward to combine stories one and two since they overlap chronologically, and story three is also easy to include because it is told from Oppenheimer's point of view and naturally follows on from the first half of his story. But story four is the most out of place, and this is the first example of why 
this film doesn't work in chronological order. When we put the scenes in order, then two and a half hours into a movie called Oppenheimer, just as we should be entering the third act, we instead cut to what is essentially a short film that treats us to 20 minutes of talking from a character we have barely seen, then round out the movie with him not getting what he wanted and revealing information we already know. Then we conclude the movie with a short epilogue of old Oppenheimer getting his medal at the White House and end fairly abruptly with Kitty refusing to shake Teller's hand. That's a pretty rubbish way to end the story, and I know that because it's how the chronological edit ends. I told you, it's a terrible movie and you shouldn't watch it. But it is where the end comes if we put everything in the right order, and that's a fact made even worse when you consider that Oppenheimer has one of the best endings of all time. So here is where we can find our first lesson in why Nolan arranged the story in the way that he did. He uses the non-linear structure to control the flow of information to the audience. He did a similar thing in Memento. And my solution to telling the story subjectively was to deny the audience the same information that the protagonist is denied. In Oppenheimer, Nolan is following the same principle, but is mostly doing it the other way around. With the exception of Strauss's story, Nolan gives the audience more information than the characters have, and he uses that information gap to either create dramatic tension or to influence our understanding of a scene or character. And throughout the original film, the main information we have that Oppenheimer doesn't is that we know the consequences of his actions. Everything we see him doing in the past is coloured by the knowledge that his life, his country and indeed the world have been forever changed by what he has done, and so we are drawn into his character and story as he moves towards becoming the tortured man that we see from the start of the film. By weaving the future with Oppenheimer's past, Nolan shows us the ripples of his actions and decisions not just in the moment, but across his entire life. That's why the ending is so powerful. In a single exchange, Nolan manages to encompass all of the film's themes while also summarising Oppenheimer's guilt-ridden realisation of what he has brought into the world. It's such a strong moment, and one that the film builds towards for its entire runtime, and it works because we the audience fully understand how heavy this burden will become on him in the years that are to follow, something that Oppenheimer himself is only just starting to realise in this moment. When Oppenheimer's story is told in chronological order, this line comes two hours into the film. It's still a powerful scene, but it's hardly the all-encompassing gut punch of an ending that it is in the original. Oh, and there's also the fact that instead of letting the moment breathe, we instead just cut to Strauss being snubbed by Einstein, and then back to a friendly Oppenheimer. It kind of undercuts the impact. And speaking of Strauss, his total fixation on what the scientists said to each other, a key mystery of the entire original film and his character arc, is totally devoid of tension or intrigue for the audience, because we already know what was said. But we'll come back to Strauss. The ending is probably the most stark example of how the non-linear structure elevates the story, but the whole film does this. A lot of the drama in Oppenheimer comes from the fact that we the audience are seeing the longer term impacts of the characters' decisions at the same moment they are making that decision. Take for instance one of the most tense scenes of the film where Oppenheimer is telling Groves about his meeting with Pash, the security chief. We see three timelines here, the meeting itself, him confessing to Groves, and finally Pash and Groves' testimonies to the security panel. In this scene, Nolan shows us the ripples of Oppenheimer's confession in the short, medium and long term at the same time as we cut between them, the music building throughout as the consequences of what he has done become clear to him immediately, and then come back to haunt him a decade later. It's a fantastic scene, but one that has all of the drama sucked out of it when told chronologically. Because Nolan uses the cross-cutting to deepen the tension by giving us information about how dangerous Pash is while the scene is playing out. When Pash first heard about Lominitz, he told the FBI he was going to kidnap him and interrogate him in the Russian manner. Pash made it clear he had no intention of leaving any witness left to prosecute. That's the man you're dancing with. Together. You've heard that. This is a man who has killed communists with his own hands. In the film, we learn that straight away, and it immediately makes us more worried for Oppenheimer in this moment. But if we only find that fact out later, the character loses a lot of his menace in this scene. What Nolan is doing here is giving the audience information Oppenheimer does not have to make the scene more compelling. Oh, by the way, this was probably the hardest scene to edit into chronological order because the meeting is shown as a flashback from Oppenheimer's conversation with Groves, which itself is a flashback from the interrogation. I wasn't confused before, but I'm certainly getting there now. But that brings me to some of the technical challenges I faced with this edit. See, this was not simply a matter of just reordering a couple of scenes and calling it a day. No, there was a lot of complexity with this. 
not least because even the framing scenes are not told in a linear fashion. In the original film, the interrogation is completely out of chronological order, constantly cutting between Oppenheimer's testimony and those of his colleagues. And again, this is done to create dramatic tension, but it makes it a bastard to edit because you have to take all of these little scenes and awkwardly mesh them together into something vaguely comprehensible. So the watchability of Cronel Oppenheimer goes downhill quite a bit when we get to this point because these moments were simply not designed to be watched as complete scenes. They were designed to frame longer scenes that took place in the past. Also, because the interrogation scenes are framing devices, Nolan will often use pre-lapped or post-lapped dialogue to move between them. If you don't know what that is, I made a whole video about it, but briefly, it's when the sound from one scene flows into the next one, like this. Would you clear Dr. Oppenheimer today? This doesn't work when the movie is told in chronological order because the dialogue doesn't match the visuals. So where this happens I have done my best to hide it, but there's no getting around the fact that some of the cuts between scenes are a bit choppy. I was careful to make sure that all of the original dialogue has been kept, it's just been moved to its correct chronological place. But that's why the edit might just feel a bit clunky in some spots. But hey, I can only work with what I'm given. The same goes for the music. Oppenheimer's score is probably my favourite from 2023, rivaled only by Spider-Verse, and it is such a powerful tool in this film. Like the dialogue, it often carries over between scenes, knitting the story together as we go from the past to the future. So by changing the order of the scenes, you corrupt the score. Now I did my best to mask this, but there are moments when the music is a bit out of step with what is happening emotionally in the film, simply because the scenes were not originally scored with their sequential order in mind. Finally, there are some times when it is just unavoidable not to tell the story in a purely linear way. The train scene is a good example of this because even though Oppenheimer is telling Groves about his conversation, there is little actual dialogue, we just cut to the memory. If I did it fully linearly, instead of looking like this... Now the FBI talked him down, but that's the man you're dancing with. Together, you've heard... It might not hurt to be. I'm gonna look out for it. And you said that to Bash. It would look like this. Now the FBI talked him down, but that's the man you're dancing with. And you said that to Bash. See what I mean? So I have kept this scene as a flashback because there really is no alternative. But I think it gets a pass because the conversation takes place only a day or two after what we are flashing back to, and I have still taken out all of the interrogation scenes from here and moved them to where they are supposed to be. The same goes for when Oppie is first pitching the idea of Los Alamos to Groves, because this is more of a montage than non-linear storytelling. As for the black and white, well here is where I had to take a creative liberty. The colour distinction in the original film is to show which perspective we are seeing. This is less important when we are watching the story chronologically because we don't need to visually distinguish between perspectives, and it is confusing to be chopping between colour and black and white within the same scene. So to make it a bit easier to watch, I edited this scene to have the colour slowly drain from Oppenheimer's world as the full weight of what he has done comes crashing down on him. Basically, from the moment the bomb is used, the world has changed forever and this is reflected visually in the film from this moment onwards. Now I will be the first to admit that this is the sort of thing film students do to make their student project seem edgier than it actually is, but it was the only way in which I can make the black and white Strauss scenes work alongside the colour Oppenheimer ones, while also trying to make the visual change work in the context of the narrative. For what it's worth, Oppenheimer's visions and flashbacks to before 1945 are still in colour, and I also restored the colour for the interrogation scenes to help distinguish that from Strauss's hearing which comes afterwards. So it should be clear to you now that the chronological version of Oppenheimer is a worse film because I have totally messed up its structure, pacing, characters, score, screenplay, editing, and even the visuals. But one thing I will say about it is that the narrative is much easier to follow when the events are just playing out one after the other. Now, as we have seen, this comes by sacrificing a lot of the mystery, tension, and intrigue, and also this is a film about the character, not the sequence of events, but I do think that some people might want to watch it chronologically for this reason. And because of that, I have taken the liberty of adding in the year to help establish the timeline. Now, I will be the first to defend Nolan for not including dates in his film. I think they're distracting, and also, when you add them it makes the pacing feel very inconsistent because sometimes we'll rattle through a whole year in a single scene, while others will span 20 minutes. The story is better when the timelines are left ambiguous. But since I already messed up the story, I figured I might as well add a bit more context for people wanting to understand when certain events took place. Finally, and I'm just assuming that this is a happy accident, but in this version, the Trinity test happens at pretty much exactly the halfway mark of the movie. It feels like when Nolan put this at the exact halfway point of Batman Begins.
But this also goes to show how this movie is not really about Trinity. Over half of the runtime of the original film is focused on what happened afterwards, and I think seeing it chronologically makes you realise that much more clearly. Anyway, those are my main takeaways from watching Oppenheimer in chronological order. Like I said at the start, for me, this was a storytelling and filmmaking exercise, and I think it was a valuable one. You can break apart and analyse the film all you like, but unless you actually sit down and watch how the linear story plays out, you can't quite appreciate the level of skill needed to craft it into a compelling screenplay in the way Nolan did. And holy crap is there a lot of craftsmanship in this screenplay. It is an incredible piece of writing and made all the more special by being adapted to screen by one of, if not the greatest living filmmaker. And I've gone and completely ruined it by putting it in chronological order. But I have made a bit of a compromise, because there are in fact two versions of Chronol Oppenheimer. The one I have been talking about for this whole video is the extended cut, which is every single scene of the original Oppenheimer film laid out in order. This is the version that I think is just terrible because that whole last hour with Oppenheimer's interrogation and Strauss's are just a bit of a mess with the choppy editing and the fact that the scenes just lose so much meaning when told this way. But I think it was important to make that edit to demonstrate the quality of Nolan's original screenplay and the role those scenes played in the narrative. But before we get to that point in time, all of the scenes leading up to the Trinity test and its immediate aftermath flow together much more smoothly because they are longer, more complete scenes than the interrogation ones. So alongside the extended cut you also have, simply, Chronol Oppenheimer. This film is identical to the Chronol Oppenheimer extended cut, but most importantly, it ends at the same point in time the original film does. We start at Cambridge, then go to Berkeley, tell the full story of the Manhattan Project and the immediate aftermath, and then end with this moment of reckoning. Trinity is the film's climax, coming about an hour and a half in, and the final act deals with Oppenheimer just starting to grasp the scale of the consequences. We see his guilt taking shape, but do not deeply explore this in the same way the original film does. This version is just under two hours long, and obviously it doesn't hold a candle to the original. But I think it tells a different, more factual story than the deeply subjective, personal exploration of regret and consequences that Nolan brought to the screen. It's much more of a traditional biopic, and probably what this movie would have looked like if another filmmaker had been the one to adapt the screenplay from Kai Bird's book. A filmmaker concerned with the sequence of events, not the character. So if you do want to watch Chronol Oppenheimer, then watch that version. Don't bother with the extended cut. It lets you appreciate the writing, acting, score, direction, cinematography and production design of the original film without dragging it all down with the disjointed ending of the extended cut. If you want to watch it then you can follow the link in the description. That will take you to a website that has all the information you need to watch either of the edits. At least it will until it's taken down. But as with my edits of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Boba Fett, fan editing is a bit of a legal grey area so I insist that you only watch this if you have access to a legal copy of Oppenheimer, either on home media or through a streaming service you have a fully paid membership of. Support the fan editing community and the original creators of the movie by only watching edits of things you have a legal copy of, it's that simple. Also the Oppenheimer Blu-ray looks fantastic and has all of these amazing special features on it so why wouldn't you want to get a copy of it? I'm not making any money off this edit, this is entirely a fan made project done as an exercise in editing, filmmaking and storytelling that I am sharing with other people interested in it for the same reason. But if you do check out the edit and want to acknowledge that in some way then please consider checking out the work that the ICRC has been doing pretty much since the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki towards nuclear disarmament, and maybe consider donating to them if you have the means to do so. If you want to support me and my work, the best way to do that is through Patreon or YouTube memberships where you can see bonus videos and other behind the scenes things I am working on. Like for this video I have uploaded a sort of editor's commentary where I walk through the Chronol Oppenheimer edits on my timeline in a bit more detail if you're interested in how I put it together and want to learn more about the technical process behind it. Oh and if you're watching this and the website hosting my Oppenheimer edit has been taken down, well, patrons get access to all of my videos a few days early so they didn't miss out. Just saying. These videos are sponsor free and every single supporter on Patreon helps me keep them that way. Tears start from just a couple of dollars and I really mean it when I say that every little bit helps. Thanks to you all and thanks to everyone else for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already, it's free and means a lot to me and I'll see you next time.